Eric, and welcome to Cafe Transcripted, episode 23. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. Hi, everybody. I'm Gavin Ashenden. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how are y'all doing? Um, right, we haven't seen you since... Oh, the... <laughs> awesome. Thank we you. haven't seen you since the coronation... We don't see you at all, but thank you for watching. Um, you haven't seen us since the coronation of King Charles III, um, but we're back. Uh, a few things to discuss. I was at the National Conservatism Conference last week in London, which was very good, um, and wrote about that for the Herald. Gavin's been writing about Anglicans and uh, how they're trans Catholics. So we, we're going to talk a bit about that. And, and, and... Artificial intelligence, too, because you've been writing about that also, Gavin. Trans Catholics and transhumanists, yes. Yeah, or humans, yes. Trans Catholics and transhumans, yeah. So I was at this conference, which was not party political. It was really, uh, in fact, many of the speakers spent a lot of their time criticising the Conservative Party for not conserving the traditions that they that you would hope they would as a Conservative Party. Um, and what I'd written in my article at the Catholic Herald is that Actually, it was those speakers who were looking at things through um, a sacramental lens that that I really think got the problems and and had a ground that they could speak from about uh, what's what's being lost in the culture. So Sebastian Morello was brilliant. Uh, Father Benedict Keeley was very good. Sebastian Milbank was good. Um, Daniel French spoke as well. So this was a, a panel called God and Country, and it's well worth watching. So if you go to the National Conservatism a Twitter feed or, or website, you'll see all the talks up there now. And actually, Melanie Phillips was very good, I think, on um, how we have really become ashamed of our of our Judeo-Christian history and um, and that we've lost education. We, we, we spend our time in education apologising and not really teaching the children about about their cultural history. We've become ashamed of it. So there was a lot of really good stuff. Um, that I would definitely recommend going to watch. Not not because you might align with the political party, the Conservative Party, but just in terms of it was a really good uh, exploration of of how um, what we've lost and why it matters that we're losing it. And even to some extent, although this wasn't an easy thing to answer, how we might um, salvage some of what we've we've lost, and also Lois McClatchy. She spoke brilliantly. She's uh she works with ADF International, I think, and she spoke about how the pro life cause is not a lost cause. Um, and in fact, I attended a Right to Life event this week, and there's a lot of young people. So I think there's definitely a renewed uh, sense, perhaps even I'd say in response to what happened to Isabel Vaughan Spruce, um, that people are starting to realise what what's being lost and how they have to stand up now and try and fight to retain it so in the darkness there there is some light I think however I know Gavin you're going to speak about Paul Kingsnorth who may take a different view and think that perhaps there is nothing left to conserve can you tell us about that yes <clears throat> well that was very really interesting I, I was quite jealous of you going to that conference I'd, I'd like to have been there and seen some of those people I was <laughs> Who was it? Who said, it was you in your article who made that very that joke about some of the cleverest people on the right, and 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 also Michael Gove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was alarmed by Paul Kingsnorth, who gave a talk at the Unheard Club, um, and uh, I've become a great fan of his. Paul Kingsnorth has been doing some work with artificial intelligence and transhumanism, and frankly, I thought these were both. But beyond my pay grade, I didn't really understand them and uh, had no experience of them. Although I've been reading a little bit, of course, it's, it's gone across my horizon. But Kingsworth gave this talk at, at the Unheard Club and said basically that the whole project of trying to conserve the present, the West, the residue of Christianity, is 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 useless. It's, it's way, way gone past that. Um, and so I, I concede for an article I've just written in the Catholic Herald of the vandals being at the gates, the back gates and the front gates. So the back gates are the people coming at us from the last century, relativism, uh, sexual disorder, uh, diversity, inclusion, inequality, trying to get us to drop our understanding of human nature and our relationship with our sexuality. Um, and we're having enough trouble fighting them off because there are so many fifth colonists in the church, people who are 
who, who are committed to, to, to an understanding of themselves as sexual beings before they're committed to, them, to an understanding of themselves being saved children of God. But King's North says that what's coming is uh, what he calls an age of, of quantity, uh, an age of the machine. And if you've had any of those emails from friends saying, hey, I've been mugged in, in Tahiti and I need you to send me a lot of money to this bank account because I can't get anywhere. Um, I, I've had elderly friends who've fallen for this and actually sent money to these people. So, um, most people are wise to it now, but but even though they all, they all used American spelling and spoke in language that, that, that was completely different, from uh, the, the the anxiety, the call to help is so powerful that people very often fall for it. However, there was a, a TV presenter being interviewed the other day, and and she was um, the the guy who was a, a, a boffin for AI said, uh, "I can recreate you uh, perfectly from everything you've put on the internet." Uh, so he then said, "Look, these are the places you've been at holiday in the last six years. I've been trawling through your social media. This is where you've been. These are the things you've said. Here are the here are the here are the." conversations you had on the internet i can clone your voice and i can reproduce your the cloning of your voice to make you say and look like anything i can reproduce you i got access to altered to to digital photography of you and your voice i can make a new you and everyone will think it's you she was completely freaked out at the level of um information he had because we all put so much of our lives on the internet so king's north was saying using a, a french philosopher who became a a Muslim and used this idea of suggesting that, that that the end of the 20th century we would be we'd lose all sense of quality and moved into quantity the area of of things and we'd have untrammeled desire uh, and capitalism has sanctified desire so any desire is okay and what digital technology would do is to promise us to meet all our desires so already in the last few weeks I've been getting adverts of chatbot ladies presenting themselves. Uh, inviting me to um, program them to be the kind of person I might most like to talk to. And they'll be very sympathetic to anything I want to talk about. Well, the mind boggles. Everyone knows where that's leading. They're already pretty convincing. I and mean, you'll have seen some of them on the internet already, but they're going to get more convincing and more more receptive to whatever it is we want to do. So it's a kind of, we're going to be moving from a sort of the the, the the, the awful, brutalized mechanics of sexual pornography to a kind of existential pornography where people, <clears throat> where, where digital representations will offer to give us everything we ever thought we wanted. And um, that's going to be a pit that's going to drag a lot of people into it. Then on top of that, there are the transhumanists who are trying to build the mind. Now, they called it the, the mind or the machine, and they're planning to download our consciousness into a digital framework that will contain it so in other words we might exist in two places at once we might <clears throat> exist as we are somatically now but we might also have a digital existence which lasts forever if if my brain can be done or my consciousness can be downloaded as a form of software then something that is me or like me or derives from me will have its own independent existence in a kind of cosmic framework it's not so much a tower of babel as a cosmos of babel now they think they can do this they think it'll be done by 2050 i have no idea but what king's north says is this is a fight for reality uh they're building a new god a new a new um a new structure for reality into which we will nestle or, or could nestle or could be downloaded and one of the things the church is going to have to do is to begin to say because G King's North suggests that it's all in the first three chapters of Genesis. It's all about just because can you can you if you can do this, can you live with the consequences? King's North is going to say we're going to recapture ethics, recapture sanctity, recapture our conviction that human beings are not material, disposable, driven by desire, but actually driven by holiness and the Augustinian notion that he made us for ourselves and away from him we're going to be in deep trouble is one we're going to have to try and persuade people about in order to uh, stand between them and this this appalling utopian experiment that makes everything we've been struggling with in the culture wars look really quite tame. It's very interesting the, uh, like that bit about the chatbot thing I thought was particularly interesting because if you look at, like you say, pornography is something that dehumanizes people and makes them objects mm. uh, that we can use. And this goes even further, doesn't it? And even that any kind of, it just takes the coercion out of it and means that any kind of relationship you have 
um, like on on a sexual level, is just basically with an, with something. Doesn't matter what it is, it, as long as it serves that, your your need. I mean, it's like, like you know, it's taking all the fun out of it, isn't it? <laughs> <It's really laughs> well, I'm sure it'll have all kinds of sexual implications. Why won't it? But I'm much more. I'm much more worried about the emotional implications. And if there's suddenly this this wonderful all understanding chatbot who knows all about me and wants to listen to me and be sympathetic to me and say the things to me I want to hear, I'm I'm likely to spend as much of my time talking to her or listening to her or uh, or engaging with her because she'll be the most sympathetic person available. Why would I? Why do I want to talk to a real human being who's only going to partially get me or rebuke me or or <laughs> when I've got a chatbot who understands? Who strokes everything emotionally that needs stroking? It's terrifying because well, we all take the easy way out. Well, Gavin, well, tell me yeah. why why it matter. Why? What would you say to somebody who uh, would say, "Look, so what? I'm I'm lonely. There's this technology. I want to feel good. Who cares? Um, anything that can be constructed that makes my life easier, more comfortable, more pleasurable. Um, why why is that wrong? What's the problem with it? We, of course, that's a Catholic, that's a superb it, question. What would you say? Now, that's a superb question. I guess the heart of it. Uh, I would say effectively because our understanding of ourselves, as we find St. Paul talking about, is that the, there's always at least two of us. There's a kind of lower self and a higher self. Sometimes for some of us, more complicated spectrum in between for those of us who verge on multiple personality disorder. But the way in which we, move, we we reconcile those two with the help of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ and the forgiveness is, is by some synthesis of the two as they struggle together. And our, the, our best friends, the people who love us most, accompany us on a journey of, of struggling with our limitations, our lower our lower desires to hurt, to to to, to revenge, to to be selfish, and in conjunct in a relationship that's that's fully compassionate and loving, to help us get beyond those things and to inspire one another to forgiveness. I mean, one of the hardest things to do in any marriage, any relationship, is is to forgive, um, and and it can only be done in a real relationship. So this whole business of forging holiness and moving from the lower self to the higher self, from from corruption to salvation can can only be done in relationship with people i mean i could never do that myself i need you to i need you as my friends i need my family i need my my community i can't do it by myself then put me into the hands of a chat bot who's just going to allow me to indulge all the weakest and most um promiscuous uh, i mean that emotionally more than anything else elements of myself i'm finished i'm, I'm going to go straight into the quicksand and never reappear but but Mill, John Stuart Mill already answered the the criticisms against Bentham about the swine ethic of utilitarianism. Um, uh, talked about higher and lower pleasures. Why do we need to bring? Why turn to the transcendent? What's the transcendent got to do with it? Why why can't you say? Well, of course Mill would agree, and we should uh, turn to opera and our fellow human beings. And there's an answer there. Why God? Well, it's Jesus or Rousseau, really, um, because because Mill and Bentham were were essentially followers of Rousseau, and they thought human beings were blank slates, in which you, if you simply increase the good, you might reduce the bad. But St Paul says something completely different. He says that what we're really struggling with is 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 an intelligent power of corruption that we give assent to, and it's not you know, and, and sadly, opera and stamp collecting and and beautiful statues won't. Won't, won't do the trick it's it's far more dynamic than that and the evil and the corruption and the flaws we all live with are too great to allow it to allow opera to do it i love opera i i'd be very holy if opera did it but i'm not at all so it doesn't um so we we need the holy spirit we need jesus we need prayer we need the whole life in the spirit uh, as the antidote to the very powerful corruption that all human beings suffer. And if anyone doesn't believe in human corruption, then look at the bloody 20th century. And I mean, the 20th century is corruption writ large. That's what human beings are like when left to opera and stamp collecting. Mm, I suppose it's what do these things point to? A symbol is always a finger pointing to the moon, isn't it? Like, uh, it's not about the finger, it's about the moon. And so we have Bruce to... Lee. Bruce Lee. That famous philosopher. <laughs> exactly. You got, you got it right. Well, also, also C.S. Lewis has a, has a lot about fingers and pointing, which yeah. is probably what Catherine's quoting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whoever. Whoever it was. <laughs> whatever. Right, right. Whatever. Whoever. Right. Awesome. I, I found that quite interesting. Last weekend, there was a there was an article in the BBC about Satanism. And a Satan, this, this Satan con, and actually Satan con was full of 
grumpy ex-Christians who couldn't do what they wanted to do and turn their back on the church because they felt so aggrieved by it and then uh, threw themselves into satan con that is full of this dark symbolism and they're so blind and the and there's there was a woman interviewed who said well i was a bit worried at first i thought they might be sacrificing babies but in the end i i got to know them and they were really good people they weren't doing that at all <laughs> at, <laughs> a, a, a paragraph later they spoke about an abortion clinic that they'd set up yes. and how it so so there's this blindness that actually so so the the symbolism that we have in our church really matters. The rituals that we have in our church really matter about keeping us about in defense against this artificial intelligence you're talking about. That it grounds us in a reality. Um, and we can so easily be turned by by false symbols uh, that, that point to a different reality. In fact, the unreal that point to the unreal, that point to artificiality. And there's that blindness to, to that, 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 that they're just they just swapped truth for lies, but they're still taking part in these in these strange, dark symbols that, that direct them and show them exactly what they're doing. And they still can't see it. And in fact, uh, proof uh, evidence that to, 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 to prove what Baudelaire said, that that most of them said, we don't really believe in the devil. Mm. No, they don't know what they're doing. No, no. But it ain't good. If, 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 if they'd ever tasted despair, mm. they, they wouldn't go anywhere. I mean, they clearly haven't. They don't understand what, what, what the dark side brings. I mean, yeah. the dark side brings this uh, lies of, of utter condemnation and despair. And anyone who's ever tasted despair would run a million yeah. miles to get away from the devil and the, the arms of Christ, who is the antidote of all despair. They have no idea what they're doing, like, like children playing with nuclear buttons. No, and in fact, the BBC uh, had an article two or three years ago about a guy called Daniel Hussein, who murdered two women in a park and was found to have been dabbling in the occult and Satanism. And although this piece seemed to be about cuddly Satanists and bad Catholics, um, I think that the reality is far more is far closer to the Daniel Hussein story um, and the abortion clinics that, that this has real effects, um, really deadly. We got on Satanism. Well done, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's no surprise, in fact, that we did steer from AI to Satanism. It's no surprise at all. Yeah. Uh, well, that, I thought uh, Gavin's piece, the camera, about... Did you write about it as well, Gavin? The trans I did, yes. I, I, yeah, I did, both. Yes. Anglicanism was really interesting. Uh, like that, I thought oh, that yeah. was really good. And then there was a bit of a conversation with Calvin, wasn't there? Robinson from GB News. Uh, which sort of I followed, <laughs> yeah. He, 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 and he interacted with all three of us a little bit, I think. And obviously, you know him. Um, and it's I, I find this whole thing absolutely fascinating. I find mm. the journey really, really fascinating. And I, I feel I was saying to Catherine, I feel a lot of empathy for Calvin and his mm. position. And you know, I did with you, like when you were sort of seeking as well, and. Like from my perspective, uh, you know, I, I think we've said before, I'm a bit, I've, uh, you know, I've always been a bit of a deus fault sort of Catholic, like that, that <laughs> you know, it seems fairly obvious that there's not. But also at the same time, regular listeners will know that I, um, you know, I, I do Bible study at the Baptist church once yeah. a week. Um, and I've got lots of friends who are Anglicans. My The best man at my wedding is, a, is, is an Anglican. Um and I've got good friends in the ordinary, so I'm sort of uh, familiar with this journey. And one of the most moving experiences that I had was when an ordinary priest took me to Walsingham, to the shrine. And that was the first time I've been to Walsingham. And it was where he really found and grew his faith and was able to explain to me that journey to, you know, to be an Anglican and to be a, a Catholic, you know, as, as, as they see it. Um, and and we all cradle Catholics. I know, like Kath Catherine's, exact, we've had this conversation a number of times. We sort of scratch our heads yeah. because we don't understand. But it's like the for me, it's like I can totally understand where Calvin is coming from because Calvin is focused on following Jesus, and yeah. these are the tools that have been given to him. These are the these are the things that have been given to him, and he's in this place where. Um, he's doing those. He's doing what he has been given. He's fulfilling that 
to the fullness of his ability. And, you know, obviously you can tell that he's really trying. He really believes it and he really uh, understands it and he's he's following it as fully as he can. And I see that with my Baptist friends. You know, I wouldn't dream of saying that they weren't authentic Mm -hmm. or that their faith wasn't authentic. Um, I think it's extremely authentic, inspirational even. Um, but I can also see that there that there are elements that are missing from that. Now, I it's you can't go to them and say, "Oh, look at you." You know, you can't just go to people and say, "Oh, but you know, look what you're missing out on. You should be in our club because we've got much better stuff." Uh, and you especially can't do that when you've got a situation when our bishops are so rubbish at Catholic, you know, that they give that you would be forgiven for thinking that. Jesus didn't have anything interesting to say if they were the only representatives of him you you ever met. You know, I mean, they never they never fail to disappoint. Um, there's very little evangelization going on. <laughs> they don't speak to the culture, which is obviously Calvin's main thing. Um, and then you've got abject heresy. You've got yeah. cardinals now and bishops advocating for anti-Christian positions from within the church. So it's very difficult to go and say, look, here is the exemplar of a Christian life. But in that quietness of your heart, when you're living your faith and your prayer life and the liturgy yourself, then there can be no doubt that this is the fullness of the faith. This is the fullness of truth is available to you. And so it's a case of living it. And when you want to go deeper, I think that these people, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this, Gavin, but it feels to me like you when you want to go deeper, all the answers are Catholic answers and you keep, you you drift into a deeper kind of faith and you find that, you know, it's like uh, the dream of Gerontius in a way, you know, you and you find that those dreams are Catholic dreams. What do you think? I, I want to put it much more, I put it much more strongly than that. Um, when I was 20, I had a, uh, a reliant Robin and uh, I thought all men knew how to manage their motor cars and their engines. And someone told me it needed decoking. So I got the engine out of my Reliant Robin and I put it in a, a vicarage where a friend of mine lived and we took it to pieces and decoked it and put it back together again. And at the end of it, there were four pieces left over that should have been in the engine and it never worked again. And the thing is, so it, it didn't work. It, you know, it had everything, but it didn't work because I hadn't put it together in the right thing. Now, if you imagine you're a Catholic for a moment and you don't, but neither the mass nor the magisterium works. So when you go to mass, there is no supernatural miracle. It's just a bit of blessed bread. There's no, there's no forgiveness in confession, and uh, and there's no agreement on what ethics are. What, what would would the church work? Would would that be a working faith? No, it doesn't work. Well, that's Anglo-Catholicism. Mm. The but they don't is, know that it is, though, do they? When you're in, no, no, they don't. No, <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, I mean, I suspected it didn't, which is why I spent my life as an Anglican priest asking the Lord to give me a special dispensation to be able to consecrate the host. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't have the authority to do this, and I'm, I'm pretty sure my orders are null and void. And I find this very upsetting, and, and, I, and it really pisses me off when people mention apostolic curi. Um, but but you know, would you mind as a special favour to me and you because I love you a lot <laughs> if you wouldn't just mind trans transubstantiating it you know and it's not just for me Lord it's for all these people don't think it's for me it's for them and, <laughs> and now did he do it well what if he didn't I suspect he didn't do it so there I I always suspected that he was really doing it in the Catholic Church up the road but wasn't doing it. And I used I put in I put in an ombre to reserve the sacrament. I put in candles. I made the candlesticks bigger. I put in more beautiful vestments. I did everything I could to make it look like it was happening. And I think that's what Anglo Catholicism is. And the trouble is, it, it's um, they don't mean Catholic when they say that. It's not Anglo Catholicism. It's Anglo. But it's Anglo nostalgic sacramentalism. They know there's something missing. They desperately want Jesus in the host. But because the people who invented their church threw the Pope out, excommunicated anybody who wanted to bring the mass, derived a liturgy where where the supernatural miracle couldn't happen, broke the link of both intention and form for priesthood and episcopacy. For a hundred years, there were no priests and bishops in the Edwardine uh, 
ordination services. They then, they then built them on backwards as if, rather like my, my Reliant engine, by, by building it on backwards, you could restore what was missing, like putting a, you know, embalming a corpse, making it look pretty, but actually it's dead. The moment they cut it off from the Pope, it died. So, so what is all the dressing up? What is all the bowing? What is what are all the cat? What do they do? Well, that's the tranny bit because you say to a, a a man who wears lipstick and high heels, look, look, love, you're just dressing up. It doesn't change your ovaries, your hormones, or your DNA. And so, Protestant Anglicans are just dressing up. It doesn't mean the miracle happens. There is no forgiveness in reconciliation. There is no transubstantiation in the mass, and there's absolutely no magisterium so why do it it's an it's an act of self-deception now this only matters when if you it only matters when it starts to matter so because it's so comfortable they have so many resources because because there are huge privileges in living in as an anglican no one tells you to be obedient there's no obedience there's, there's no humility in terms of putting yourself under someone's authority uh, there's no accepting pieces of dogma you don't very much like um there's 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 you know you can do what you want it's 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 self-indulgent paradise but the thing about becoming a catholic is you have to pay a price for it and the, the price is humility and it's obedience and it's and it's li <laughs> it's living with people who are not very good at fulfilling the office because you because you love and you trust the office mm. i love and i trust the office of the papacy i happen to think that papa francisco is not the best pope we ever had but the, but the office is the best thing that ever was and so it's a Protestant thing to say, I can't be a Catholic because the bishops aren't much good and I don't like papal ambiguity. That's a Protestant response. The Catholic response is to say, look at this amazing structure. It's got us through 2,000 years and it'll go on doing it. Sorry about the present tenants. There'll be a wash and brush up soon. We'll get some other ones. The Holy Spirit will come to our rescue. And so the reason I wrote it is not because I want to be, say, my new club's better or look, I've seen the light everybody else ought to, but... But because, partly because you saw that in, the forward in faith bishop said, guys, the only way to be to really save ourselves is to be truly, authentically, totally and utterly Catholic, he said, <laughs> when he's being he's guy, totally and utterly. Really yes, of course he is. But he's got to say that. Yeah. He's got he's got to keep up the pretense the emperor has clothes or, mm -hmm. or else he has to become a Catholic. Why not right, just become so, a Roman Catholic? So there's a couple of things that I, that I think are interesting. One is that, you know, like Calvin's narrative that Anglo that Anglo Catholics are, they predate Rome. I, I heard him say that, that it's a Celtic version of, of Catholicism that predates, like, you know, the, the papacy, which I thought was sort of an interesting argument. Mm. Um, yes, no, it's, 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 it's completely untrue. And I was talking to the Bishop of um, Waterford about this. I, I was uh, Bishop Al Al Alphonsus, a lovely guy. And I was saying, look, I don't know enough about this. I know quite a lot about it. But I was saying, what's, you know, what don't I know? And he said, go and read, uh, go and read St. Patrick's life story. It's all in there. He's totally, I mean, you can't get a more Celtic saint than, than you know, he's the embodiment of everything that happened on the West Coast, of all Celtic monastic spirituality. It all goes back to Patrick. He said, read Patrick. You could not get more Roman than Patrick. That's that's it. What they've done is they've reimagined it in their own image, according to their own preferences, to cut out the the Roman Catholicism, to diminish it. it it's, a, it's a fancy. It doesn't cost you anything to say that um, there was an indigenous Christianity that was pre-St. Augustine of Canterbury, and it got on very well, so we can too. But it isn't, it isn't true in that sense. Uh, and certainly if you look across the... the I got to know St. Martin of Tours quite well. And if you read his amazing biography, it's completely Roman Catholic. Yeah, um, all the of, problem well, is yeah, they're, they're not... Say, yeah. Existentially, what you're left with is mm. Roman Catholicism, isn't it? Like, if you look yeah. at the church, if you believe in God and if you believe in divine providence, what we have is Roman Catholicism. That can That's all it can be. And to be part of some splinter element of a thing that might be, and to say, oh, well, we're following this you know, difficult, confused line of authority or whatever. Just you've just got to, at some point you've got to have that humility to get with the program, haven't you? And the other, the other, you have, and you, you've got thirty nine steps. The yeah. thirty nine I. Thirty nine steps. Yeah. That's, that's part of you have to. Don't you have to ascend to the thirty nine articles, which are viciously and. Yes, they do. It's so a, the mass is a, bla 
<laughs> well, you can't. The, it says the mass is 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 a vain, a vain and blasphemous fable. It says, how can you be an you Anglican priest and stand up? You, you, well, you can't. So, but then you see the Anglicans say, "Oh, yeah, but you only have to assent to the thirty-nine articles, and nobody knows what it means to assent to them." Well, that becomes duplicitous. I mean, that's trickery. That's dishonest. How is God served by dishonest, duplicitous trickery? He's not. A, he's not at all. I mean, I'm afraid I find myself saying that actually, the Anglicanism isn't even a church. It's it's a collection of different theological positions and different spiritualities. Uh, for the sake of producing an Erastian uh, religious structure. And it does it quite well, but it's not a church. You can't leave it. There's, nobody knows what it is to belong to it. If you ask any Anglican in the street, what are the constituent elements of belief you have to have to be an Anglican? Not one of them will tell you. They don't know. How is that a church? It isn't. But the problem is, it's, a, it's, it's nice and pious make-believe. I don't, but and let's, pe people who want to be Anglo Catholic are, are expressing very good and wholesome holy desires. They're saying, I want Jesus in the sacrament. I want beauty, liturgy, transcendence, authority. But you know what? I'm not going to pay the price for them. I just want them on my own terms. And that's the bit that I think is, is, is tranny. That, that, that's because it, it and, I, and the reason I say it with some conviction or, or passion is it costs me a lot to become a Roman Catholic. It costs you both a lot to live as Roman Catholics. It doesn't cost anything to be a tranny Catholic. It doesn't cost anything. It's dressing up. And and, and therefore, you have to ask, what, where is the virtue in that? It's very much like St. John Henry Newman called it mimetic, didn't he? And one of his mm. that Anglicanism yeah. is mimetic. Yeah. Um, that it, it replicates, it's like a phasmid, it pretends to be Catholic, or it has all the outward signs of Catholicism, but none of the actual, it doesn't cost you anything Substance. in terms of morals, yeah. But the Robin engine doesn't work, there are bits yeah. left over, it's not It's not put together properly. It looks nice it's as an engine though. It's though, isn't it, from this side, like it's a difficult discussion to have yeah. in charity. Well, I think that, well, it's, it's, um, it's sorry, Catherine. Go on. No, I was just going to say that's why relationship is so important, and it is difficult. Um, so, you have people standing on the side of the road with signs saying Jesus loves you, and that's great. Um, but it's 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 not hugely effective as an evangelization tool because it's it, there's no relationship. So you're just walking past someone, and the message is true, but it's not grounded in relationship. So I think even what we're doing here is is difficult because we're doing it through the medium of the internet, and we're not we're not interacting with people. So, but the things you're doing, Mark, going into the Baptist church, and we all do var variations of that, is actually meeting people and having these discussions. Because I said on Twitter in response to your video, Gavin, that this is an act of love. And I really believe it's an act of love. Tell me why you think that's true as well, that this is this is loving. Well, so first of all, I don't want to offend any of my friends. I can't tell you how many dear friends I've got who remain Anglican and who whose piety and love of Jesus and love of the church is very deep and better than mine. There's not that at all. It, the thing that really pushed me over the edge were the Eucharistic miracles. So for a very long time, I talked about the real presence, whatever the real presence is. I've been looking it up recently and, there's, you know, Nobody knows what the real presence is. Um, but the Eucharistic miracles really blew me away because I finally understood what transubstantiation was intended to convey. So trans transubstantiation is not a thing. It's an, it's an idea derived from Aristotle, but in a particular scholastic context, to try and give those of us who want to get a mystery made sense of in our head a means of doing it. But that's not really a legitimate process. It's just that you can't avoid it. Uh, it, transubstantiation doesn't happen like that. These are Greek philosophical categories we have overlaid over a mystery. So the, how do you distinguish between the real presence and transubstantiation? The thing that really blew me away was when they took bleeding hosts <laughs> that Catholic priests had dropped and they, they put them in water and they began to bleed and they took them to the laboratory and they found living white blood cells, living white blood cells. That's, that's transubstantiation. That's the Catholic mass. And are there any Anglican Eucharistic miracles? I don't think there are. Actually, to put it in brackets, there are Anglicans who, like me, had some Episcopal derivation from Catholic bishops. And it may be that amongst them, they do have the power to do it. Actually, I thought one of the reasons I accepted this rather quaint, eccentric uh, Episcopal post with orders that came from the Brazilian Catholic bishop in South America was because it was a way of, of dealing with the deficit of my own sacramental inability. But so, so let's say that in America, there are others like that. That's great. That's really wonderful. 
but it still doesn't doesn't mean that you have you live the full Catholic life, which 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 can only be if you're in sacramental relationship with with the Petrine office, I think. And that's so uh, the act of love is to say to people, look, do the thing properly. Don't you know there, there are all kinds of privileges. It makes it easier to be an Anglican. You get property, you get different rules, mm-hmm. you know, it's where you're used to being. But but the real thing is the Catholic Church needs everybody on board. It was when my local diocesan bishop said, Gavin, stop doing this outside the church, do it inside the church. The church needs you. And I didn't wasn't just being flattered. I realized the Catholic Church really did need me. Actually, I didn't know how much it needed me. I really didn't know what a shit show it was. <laughs> and, and so people say, well, look, it's a terrible shit show. Fine pan into fire, they say. And I said, that's why we have to become Catholics. Yeah. I love because that. Because it's all um, hands on deck. I love that little quote from Mother Teresa to Malcolm Muggeridge when he said, Well, you know, God needs good people outside the church as well. And she just said, No, he doesn't. And uh, <laughs> and, and said, and yes. so he, I know it's not that simple, but 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 actually there there's a beauty to that simplicity. No, he doesn't, and he became Catholic. Um I thought it was interesting. I spoke with you, Mark, about the 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 Eucharistic miracles. And I think this is the difference between mm between men and women and really the masculine and the feminine because i i don't i, I think that's wonderful the buena sera miracle uh the cells the white blood cells the blood type but for me that wouldn't that wouldn't convince me of anything and and mark was saying that that's because you're a woman and i thought that was really interesting because it also links with with the ai stuff because um mm. i really see that as the godless masculinity that that Alice von Hildebrand spoke about and I think we've lost that femininity and so that what you, when you say that it appeals to the masculine it's an answer um everything is an answer but we've lost the ground the question the space of the feminine and so we're just filling 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 and and so that that's I thought that was just interesting Mark that that scientific approach which is good and will convince people and people are convinced in different ways doesn't really do anything for me in terms of the mystery yeah, it's, I always think it's both ends, you know, that we yeah. need, we're like, you know, we need to to layer up that knowledge. And I know from um, sort of catechesis that it really does help guys to have those, mm. fat, you know, to a bit of science goes a long way. Sort yeah. of thing, you know. And there's a lot of science out there. So, you know, it's all good. Not scientism. We're suffering no. today from a lot of scientism. Um, and, you know, that's sort of a real problem. And especially when it comes to, um, the like the Eucharist is a brilliant way of, of sort of talking about that, and it, it sort of strikes me what Gavin was saying. You know that, that the whole thing about um, with with the Baptists, I find that what you're doing is that, like there is their sincerity and their genuine desire for Christ is a wonderful thing, yeah. and when you you can layer it up with a bit of Catholic colour, it makes it becomes so much more powerful, and they they love it. They absorb because what they and that makes me think that their faith has enormous integrity because yeah. they're just interested in Christ. And that reminds me of me because I kind of feel like, you know, I always felt like uh, quite attracted to the Dominican spirituality, that the truth was at the at the forefront of my own search for faith. You know, that, that was... It's, it's all... You know, it, to, sorry, Mark. To quote Mrs. Bennett, it's all about Descartes. I mean, it, it all goes back to, to the Baptists are Cartesians. I think, therefore, I am. The world of the spirit is separate from the world of the body. And the problem, the, the difference is not the problem with, with Baptists or Anglican piety. God bless them. They're as pious as anybody. It's what they make of matter and whether or not matter can be infused with sanctity. Catholics have discovered that it can be, which is why we do relics and, and bodies that don't decompose and hosts that bleed because that's how profoundly the kingdom of heaven's got into them. But Baptists, being good children of the Enlightenment and being Cartesian thinks the spirit and the body are all uh, totally different areas and we don't expect them to interact. That's where the difference is. Not not with piety, not with what, but but all to do all to do with the interlacing of of matter and spirit. Yeah. Their understanding of sacrament is that it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't actually Yeah, exactly. Just an outward sign. Yeah, but it's it's, it's very interesting. I'd be very interested to know what they mean by that. Doesn't do anything in what way do they understand that well i think well, they're, they're so, almost the same fair enough. no uh, well uh, uh, so we we recently had one of our little team uh, was baptized and um i was talking to them about it and they were saying that um you know that that the change has already occurred they've you know in the mind 
and then the like the the actual baptism, the sacrament is just a a sign of that change having taken place, which really disappointed me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thought, you know, and they funnily enough in there they've got a little handbook, almost like you might call it a catechism, Gavin, <laughs> yeah. that they've put together in this church. <laughs> with some fundamentals in it. And in there, it defines baptism, which is their one sacrament, obviously, and it defines sacrament, and it defines sacrament as an outward sign of an inner grace, which is pretty much the same definition we would use. But obviously, we believe that there's an ontological change and that God gives us those outward signs because, you know, revelation, God is in the, is in the world. God is in the world. Yeah, and so, so they... Yeah. they so they think the Catholics practice magic, and that's why they don't like the sacramentalism, because they think that, that, that our, if we think our prayers affect matter, that's like magic, isn't it? So in other words, they take they take the black arts and say there can't be a Christian version of, of them making them white arts. We have to get rid of the arts altogether. But the black arts are, in fact, a perversion of the white arts. There is indeed a Christian magic, if you want to use that kind of language. Magic happens every time the Mass is celebrated. Jesus did magic when he healed people from the dead and restored eyes. That's Christian magic, if you want to use that word. But, but, but it's become, of course a Gnostic word from Magus, and we don't use it. We've left it only to the black arts people. But it's put, put out of their fear of the black arts, the, the Baptists say, no, the, nothing happens to the matter. It's all in the purity of the heart or the mind. And that's why it's Cartesian. That's it's that, And it's not fully incarnational, which is why, again, they don't understand... You know, they don't understand that st statues bleed, icons weep, the Holy Spirit gets into, into matter. And St. Paul's handkerchief, what do they think what that was about you know this is a magic relic that heals they, they have if you ever want to upset a baptist ask him about the the, the early relic of paul's handkerchief because that really blows their enlightenment mind view apart and the only way they can stitch it back again is to become a catholic mm. <laughs> anyway. no it's great it's and that's what i love you know i love the sort of uh, interaction because it's it feels very much like coloring in those pictures in a lovely way you know because they're I, you know, as I say, I, I'm, in, I'm in awe of their faith. And so that adds a great deal to me. But at yeah. the same time, you know, uh, we had a great discussion when they, they had communion at the church and they were they knew that I'd have a problem with it. And that, so they sort of confronted me about it. And in order to try and uh, make me feel better, they asked if I'd actually preside over the <laughs> oh bless! That's wonderful. But imagine, ima imagine if the Baptists came Roman Catholics with all their passion for evangelism, and and, and learnt and and then learnt to understand the power of the of the power of of holy matter. I mean, that's what the devils managed to do by splitting Anglicans and Baptists and Catholics into separate places, giving them all different graces, each where we need each other's graces. We need the Anglicans and the Baptists to become Catholics. Just as Catherine said, God does not need them outside the church. Everyone's got to get back in the real church, bringing all the gifts and graces that have been separated because of these wretched schisms. Yeah. Exactly. That's perfectly said, yeah. And only the Catholic Church answers that that who we are, yeah. the creature we are. Um, and that's that's the thing, is, ha is if you really dig down, you say they love Christ, and of course they do, but if you really go to the end of that, what does... How does that then manifest in us as human persons? Um, how do we how do we live as body and soul, one human person? And the sacraments give answer to that in 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 the only way that that is possible. And if and that and that's real. What does that's why I say what does reality actually mean then? Um, I, I've always had this a real effect uh, through that through the sacraments. Um, I'm sorry to talk across you. I, as I keep on. I think I'll forget my point of view. But so I haven't finished. I got. I got too excited and carried no, away. Go, go. Go well, I've always had this image of of the, of the Catholic Church as a big Rolls Royce, and and um and so there are three images. There's the Rolls Royce, there's petrol, and there's the, and there's the instruction book, and the Pentecostals have got petrol, but they keep on putting it into these go karts. And they go zooming around the track and then they do they do one lap of the track and then they blow up in smoke and excitement and they build themselves another go-kart. 
But all the while, there's the Rolls Royce there with this magnificently precise engine, and and the petrol. Put that petrol in the Rolls Royce, and it'll go for millions of miles. <laughs> it will never blow up. But and and the and the the, the, the dear Protestants are immersing themselves in the guidebook, but they don't have any petrol or 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 a car to sit in. They understand perfectly the theory of it, but it's not. The, so this is very unfair to everybody. But you have to have. You know, the Catholic Church is the Rolls Royce of ecclesiologies, but it badly needs fuel and needs people who understand the instructions. And 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 the evangelicals understand the instructions because they read the Bible, and the Pentecostals understand the importance of fuel because they blow it up all the time. And both of them belong in the Rolls Royce. So guys, come back and <laughs> join the church Jesus founded. Brilliant. That's exactly what we need. Right, look, you guys. What we need. You've got to go to work. So far, I'm gonna have to go back to work. <laughs> Gavin, Gavin's got to go and go and talk to his chatbot. So um we'll we'll call it a <laughs> <laughs> have a nice afternoon, Gav. Harsh. Uh, have mercy. <laughs> Bless thanks. you all. Good. Thanks for, for watching and listening. We'll see you again for Catholic Unscripted 24. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. Uh, and I'm Gavin Ashenden, and there is no chatbot. No. <laughs>